to stop the decline. Got it. So early, early in the spring, when the drought season opened, I would walk up and down the Oriskany Creek and Turkey Creek trying to catch native brown trout. And then in the fall, I would hunt the forests along Oriskany Creek for squirrel and deer. You know, and it wasn't until years later, probably 25 years later, that I realized that many of the plant material that I had been walking through was edible. In fact, one afternoon, I was up visiting my parents on Dugway Road, and uh, it was a spring, early spring day, and I went for a walk down Dugway Road past the second bridge, and I looked up on the hillside, and the hillside was covered with ramps, what we call ramps down here, and what you all call leeks up there, so Allium trichocum. I had been studying ramps for probably, oh, you know, maybe 10 years down in North Carolina and Virginia, and I had been living beside them on Dugway for 20 years, and I had been oblivious to the fact that here was this edible plant just right there in the woods. I walked down the railroad tracks. They were even growing in the railroad tracks, you know? Then I dug some up, and I took them home, and I made my uh, parents an omelet that morning, uh, and I convinced them that this, this is what I had been studying and this is what I should be. So, you know, over the last 46 years of studying forests and forestry and working in this discipline, I really come to develop a really broad perspective on forests and forestry and forest products and how, you know, we can manage forests for more than just timber or more than just wildlife or more than just water. And they really mean a lot more than that. Uh, and so I want to talk to you today about that. So soon, maybe not right now, your forests probably don't like this, look like this, but maybe in the next two or three weeks, you'll start uh, seeing some green, green stuff popping up out of the forest. You know, one of the first um, spring ephemerals that come up is allium. I'll call them leeks or ramps. Uh, and they, so they pop up, this is February, down here, they'll start popping up in about three weeks up there, maybe a little bit longer. The blood root will start popping up and sticking at their little white flower will come out, you know. Maybe people are out there tapping the maple trees in our conversation just before the start of this presentation. Uh, people were mentioning that they had just tapped their trees. Folks down here have already tapped, they probably tapped two weeks ago. Right, So that forest, it comes out like you see on that screen early in the spring, and there are all sorts of spring plants that are popping up that have both food value, like the ramps, or medicinal value, like blood root. Later, it looks like a jungle. And the forest down here look, literally look remind me of a jungle. And you have to look really close down in that green stuff to find you know, plants like American ginseng that's harvested for its medicine, or golden seal, which is harvested, or black cohosh, or Virginia snake root that you see down along the forest floor. And people are still out there collecting, right? There are people that are out there collecting food and medicine. The guy in the picture, he's one of the good guys. He's not a collector. He's a botanist in Kentucky, and he's showing how people have stripped the bark from slippery elm to make medicine for, uh, for throat lozenges. So we go, so this is a whole cornucopia of plant material that people are out harvesting um, from things like blueberries to mushrooms. Um, fiddlehead ferns will be coming up soon. You know, I came across one early in my career, a, a, um, or an entrepreneur down in Tennessee that would go out in the forest and collect flowers and pollen and make jellies and jams out of them. We see walnut, people are collecting walnut to make food and actually medicine out of walnut. So there's a whole source of stuff. And it goes into markets that we use every day. If you go into the local um, drugstore in Clinton, you'll be able to find things like blue cohosh or salt palmetto or wild yam or slippery elm. 
if you go into the CVS um, drugstore, if you go into Walmart, all of these products that are starting, that originate, that grow here in our forests, end up in the local pharmacy as over-the-counter drugs. Like the only one in that picture that doesn't grow in this area is salt palmetto. And that's a whole nother story, but it, it comes from the forests of Florida. And Flor the forests of Florida are, are the sole source for the global uh, berries for the global market or salt palmetto. So people that males, men particularly, uh, that are my age and older should be taking this for inflamed prostate. And for the forest of Florida is where it comes from. So how much of this stuff is harvested? I've done some looking at back at uh, the National Forest and Bureau of Land Management. And in 2013, they reported over 670,000 pounds of food and over what, 290, almost 300,000 gallons of fruit were harvested from the national forests and, uh, and from BLM land. Uh, typically, you see there in the bottom, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife keeps track of, of American ginseng the harvesting. And over that 13-year uh, period that you see there, something like almost 900,000 pounds of wild American ginseng was harvested from the forests, from North Georgia all the way up into New Hampshire and Maine. Basically, the Appalachian forest chain is the place where American ginseng comes from. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. And how much is this worth? I estimate that on a wholesale value, for non-timber forest products coming out of, off of public lands, the National Forest and BLM was about a billion dollars. That's wholesale value. That does not include stuff that's coming off of private land like American ginseng, which about $27 million goes to ginseng harvesters directly. Uh, it doesn't include uh, something like salt palmetto or the estimated retail value of salt palmetto was about $31 million. So I think, I think it's easy to say that a billion dollars is really a low estimate on the value of, of these products. And interestingly enough, on a per unit basis, so pound for pound, American ginseng is far more valuable than even the most valuable black cherry tree or the most valuable walnut tree. So where would you, if you were an investor, where would you put your money? Think about that for a moment. So I wanna talk about harvest impacts today. And I wanna talk about it from an economic perspective and from an ecological perspective. And I'm gonna to touch on a couple um, a couple examples. This, this just shows you American ginseng, and I could talk to you for hours about that, but the picture in the lower left-hand corner is about, is back in 1928, I believe, and it's a pile of ginseng root of about 1,700 pounds. And this guy from West Virginia uh, would buy it from the local people and then uh, ship it to China. Most of the production that you see of American ginseng, about 90% of it comes from four states, from Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and uh, Kentucky. If you look at down at that lower right hand. So let me regress here a little bit and talk basic economics. Now, you're probably, I'm sure there's somebody out there saying, why is he gonna talk about this basic supply and demand curve. Well, bear with me for a moment. The basic economic theory says that the supply curve goes up and to the right. So as quantity harvested or the energy that you expel to make a product increases, you're gonna make more money, right? Supply and basic supply and demand. So if a, a normal product, like uh, let's say just a, you know, 
Think about a wood product or anything, any kind of normal product there. The more you harvest, the more money you make, right? Well, let me really regress here and talk about fisheries in international waters. Why are we talking about this? Well, back in the 1950s, before I was born, this guy, Gordon, did some research on open access fisheries. And he found that these, pro so an open access fishery, international waters, people are out in the Northern Atlantic and they're fishing for cod and they're fishing for tuna and anybody has access to it. So he figured out that these open access resources like this, they're, that have fixed production, that have no ownership, anybody can access to them, and they are really slow to reproduce, they can exhibit a phenomenon called a backward bending supply curve. So if you look at their that graph in the upper right left-hand corner there, you can see that the harvest gets to a point and then it, the harvest starts to decrease, but the price for that fish or the, the value of that continues to increase. And this kind of backward bending supply curve is indicative of a natural resource that's being overexploited. Gordon also figured out that if you regulate international fisheries, you can change that supply curve back to the normal way. And they did that by increasing the, the size of the nets so they caught bigger fish and let smaller fish go away, right? So now, why did I talk about that? We did that for American ginseng. And American ginseng, we derived the supply curve for American ginseng. And we found that it is acting like an open access resource, a common good. It's open, it's acting, the evidence indicates that ginseng is, um, well, being overexploited, it's acting like an overexploited uh, natural resource, a product that is in decline. Now, the Fish and Wildlife Service tried put some regulations on it and increased the age limit, so you nothing below ten years could be harvested. Uh, political pressure was so strong that after four or five years, they had to cut that back, um, and so we see this phenomenon continuing. The scary part is that American ginseng uh, is not a product by itself, but it, it shares a habitat with a suite of medicinal plants that are out there harvesting. So everybody has access to those other products as well. So let me now turn to Slip Realm. So obviously from an economic standpoint, we can show that um, that harvesting is having a negative impact on some of these plants. Let's talk about slippery elm for a moment. So here's a tree. It's similar to American elm. It may be impacted by the Dutch elm disease. Um, the people go out in the forest. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. They strip the bark. They do this in the spring. They come back. They take the outer bark off, uh, which you see the woman holding it up there. And then they use the inner bark, which they then pulverize, and they make it into lozenges for uh, sore throats, basically. <clears throat> I wish I had some right now. What we found out, so that what we found out is that the mean annual net change in biomass, so that means the amount of bulk material that's in the forest has been declining since 2005. So the, the, the graph or the figure on the lower right-hand side is the uh, natural distribution for slippery elm. And interestingly enough, if you look closely at that map, the little dots are where we have inventory plots on them. And if you look really closely, it's, they're distributed along riverways. So if you look up in Minnesota, and down past Missouri and Arkansas, that's the Mississippi River. And then over to the right is the Ohio River. So it's a rip, it's a riparian zone tree. What we found is that mortality has been increasing over time. And 
the net change, so that's taking in growth and subtracting out mortality and removals has actually declined over, over the last um, 14, 15 years. Moving on, this is one of my other favorite plants, black cohosh. I don't know if you have it up in New York. It's probably pretty rare up in New York. It's quite prevalent down here. Um, it's a, the root is harvested. It's been shown effective against menopausal symptoms. Um, if you ever see it, it, the plant's about a meter high, about three feet high, and then it sends up these racine flowers that can go two meters high, and you can look through the forest and you'll see all these flower stalks sticking up. It's just a phenomenal plant. So we did set up some research on this plant. Um, we did science, basically. We went out of the woods, we collected all sorts of data, we dug up plants, we measured plants. Um, but before I continue, let me just emphasize how much is being harvested of this black cohosh. The American Herbal Products Association, a leader in the herbal industry, tracks about 22 medicinal plants. About 11 of them are from Appalachia. The one highlighted here is black cohosh. So on average, the average annual harvest between 2001 and 2005 was about a quarter of a million pounds. And between 2006 and 2010, it had increased probably over 25% to about 280,000 pounds. Unfortunately, I don't have any data after that. Um, the retail sales of black cohosh in 2018 was, was about $32 million. So that's pretty significant. And the Appalachian forest chain is the source for black cohosh for the world. So we did this experiment, right? And don't worry, don't worry too much about the graphics. Look at the, the, the left-hand graphics are when we first went in and we inventoried the plant and you can see that the top, the top graph is the total coverage. The bottom graph is the number of stems. And the three different columns, the one on the far left is a control. So we didn't harvest any of that. And the two others, there's a 30%. So we harvest a third. And then we harvested, excuse me, two thirds. And they look pretty much the same. Well, three after three years of harvesting, you can see the difference, right? And like, so this is, this is before, this is the initial harvest, and this is after three years. And you can see a major decline in this experimental harvest. We think that the reason that the, that the control had decreased is probably because people had been trampling at it and there was all sorts of uh, impacts of it. Because if you look after one year of recovery, so we stopped harvesting, we went back this next year, and we then did an inventory. And you can see that the 30% is pretty much recovered. The other two have not recovered at all. And we went back, do I have another graph? Yeah, this, this may be a little confusing, but we're trying to project when the plant populations will get back to normal. And the top one, the flat line is the control, that's a zero. So it's back to normal pretty quickly. The square dots are the 30% and the triangle is the 66%, the two thirds. Both of those indicate that they're not recovering from a three year harvest, three years of harvest. We've looked at it later and they were still not projecting. This was after three years. We looked at it after six years and they were still not recovering from a harvest. So what does it mean for sustainability? Because everybody's talking about sustainability now. We can just, everything is all about sustainability, right? We think about what is it, what, what does that mean? Well, I suggest that it basically, had, there are four things that you need to know. Four pieces of data, four pieces of information that you need to know to determine whether something is sustainable. The harvest is sustainable. 
You need a starting inventory. How much is there? Then you need to know how much is being added every year, right? Right. As long as those two pieces are greater than or equal to how much is being humans are taking out and how much is dying back, that can be sustainable, right? So now as a forester, I can go into your forest and we can measure the diameter of the tree and the height of the tree, and we can get a starting inventory. I can come back every year and I can do those same measurements and I can tell you how much growth is happening every year. I can then tell you how much is being cut because we can just see, you can see how many logs are coming out and you can measure that long, right? And you can measure mortality pretty easily by going into the forest and observing it. But when the products are, come from a root, how do you do that, right? Think about that. If a product is coming from the root, how do you figure that out? So this woman, this, these are the racemes of black cohosh that I was telling you about, right? And you, that whole forest, the whole understory of that forest that you're looking at right there is black cohosh. So we did it, a study and this woman participated, a college student from Radford University. Um, we, we acted like archeologists and we carefully harvested each of these plants in, the, in a meter, you know, we did science. We weighed the roots, we measured the height of the plant, we measured the canopy cover, and we looked at the relationship between the above ground biomass and what's below ground. And we developed this tool that allowed us to inventory how much root material is in the ground. So now you can go into a, you know, a patch of a black cohosh, take some measurements and estimate how much is in inventory. So we got a starting inventory. The problems, how the problems come out and the challenges come out when you try to figure out how much growth is going on in that root, because they're, they're living beings and they're growing, they're expanding. And at the same time, they're, they're dying back. So it's really difficult to figure out how much is being added every year. And that's here in one of the challenges, right? And then you figure out how much is, being harvested. How much do people remove every year? Well, I showed you some of the figures on a national scale, but we need to know how much is being harvested at a patch level, and then how much is being is dying back. So, you know, I can tell you that on an annual basis, this is how much black cohosh is being harvested, but I can't tell you on a patch level how much is being harvested. And herein lies the particular challenge, one of the challenges. How are we doing for time? We're doing all right? We've got about a half an hour, 10.30 right now, Jim. So let me just go back to this. So again, the big challenge is how much is declining. So then I asked the question, can we manage the forests for all these medicinal plants and food plants that are coming out there, right? We do a wonderful, the United States has some of the best managed forests in the world, hands down. We do an excellent job of managing those forests for timber, for wildlife, for water, for endangered species, for biodiversity, right? We know how to do that. We've been We've had science-based management in this country since the early 1900s. We have over a hundred years of data on figuring out how to manage those forests for wood. As a matter of fact, we have national legislation that was crafted in 1908, I believe, called the Organic Act. And the Organic Act says that we the United States will have a source of timber and water in perpetuity, in perpetuity. So they would assure that 
uh, your grandchildren, my grandchildren, their grandchildren will have forest, forest products available and water forever. Yet we don't do anything about medicinal plants or food plants coming out of the forest. Can we do it? Absolutely. I firmly believe that we can do it if we put our minds to it. So we looked at what would it take to, to manage for American ginseng? And we looked at how much is being harvested uh, throughout the 19 states that are allowed to harvest it. And we looked at the size of the forest that where these products, these plants came from. What we learned was that the bigger the forest, the more expansive the forest, and the bigger the trees produced more American ginseng. So what does that tell you? That would tell me that if I left my forests alone and didn't cut them down, or if I extended the rotation length of those forests. So right now, the rotation length of most forests are probably hardwood forests, are probably 80 to 100 years. So every 80 to 100 years, they'll cut them for timber. If we extended that and let them get bigger and bigger, we would have better habitat for American ginseng. And remember, the ginseng is not just the only species, it's a suite of species, right? That you would have habitat for. So one, don't cut your forest as often. Second, though, if you do cut, what's the, what's the impact of the canopy, the tree canopy on the plants below? So we looked at this for black cohosh and we took pictures above. You can see this picture look, you know, looking at the canopy and we measured the amount of shade in that. And then we looked at the plants below it and we wanted to see how much, how many plants were there? What was the canopy? And what we found was that as the canopy became thinner, you had more plants. So there was this fine line that if we could cut some of the canopy out, remove some of the trees, we could produce more black cohosh, right? So there's a balance between letting your trees grow and your forest grow and cutting it, right? But foresters know how to do this. These are really basic silvicultural techniques. So we can, we can produce some shade, we can cut some trees out and still have these plants growing. And let me just reiterate that, you know, ginseng is only one of, of probably 20 different species that are growing in the same habitat. So we did some recent research coming out of Virginia Tech, look, tried to figure out what were the different plants that people were, were, were buying. And you can see here, the four big ones were golden seal, bloodroot, black cohosh, and I believe that's Virginia snake root. But then the graph below it shows you, well, probably another dozen species, things like stone root or wild yam, blood root, fringe tree bark. That's a southern thing. I don't think we have that up there. May apple. Do you have may apple up there? I don't think so. But you can see that there's a whole suite of species that people are harvesting, and you could manage for at the same time. I would be remiss if I did not talk about this plant. This is, these are ramps. I've been studying ramps now for almost 23, 24 years. And uh, I started because I got interested in ramp festivals. We have festivals down here where every spring community groups like um, local fire departments and rescue squads and churches will go out in the woods and they will collect this plant, bring it back, clean it, and then organize a supper. And sometimes that supper is just for the parishioners. Other times it's for anybody who wants to come and people will drive hundreds of miles to go to these festivals. I found out that one, 
these groups are harvesting hundreds of pounds. One group in Western North Carolina was harvesting over 800 pounds of this plant for their annual festival. Now, that group generated 90% of its income. This was a fire department for this small town. They generated 90% of their income from that one day festival. So they rely on 800 pounds of this plant. Now, 800 pounds, how much is that? That could be, think 80 plants to a pound sometimes. So that's a lot of plants, right? And it's old growth. It could be very much old growth plants. So if you look at this, this is a bunch of the plants. I pushed them back because I wanted to see how many bulbs were there. Each of those petioles that you see is connected to a bulb. And if you think about the reproduction of ramps, maybe I've got it here. So that's, that, that plant right there could be 50 or 60 years old, easily 50 or 60 years old, right? I bring this up because this, this shows the kind of life cycle of ramps or uh, allium uh, in the spring. So this is February. By the end of March, right, they'll start poking their heads out and you'll see little green shoots, right? Then the leaves begin to emerge uh, and they get full by the end, middle of May, middle of April, excuse me. Meanwhile, the scapes or the flower stalks will start to emerge in May. The, the leaves die back. So as soon as the snow goes away, the soil starts warming up. These plants start poking their heads out and they grow really quickly. They'll grow from about six millimeters, so about the size of my pinky, to about the size of my thumb in 10 to 12 weeks. So they're photosynthesizing like crazy. They're just producing this, you know, photosynthetic material, those carbohydrates like crazy because when the cat tree canopy fills out, their leaves die back and they no longer can photosynthesize. And so they have to produce all their carbohydrates in this short period of time, 10 weeks. And then they consume the bulb, literally consume the bulb until next March when they pop their heads out again. So if, the, if there's enough moisture, in the soil, they will be, you know, maybe a little bit bigger than the size of my finger. Maybe they get a little bit bigger and they just, they do that whole thing, right? So then in June and July, the, they flower and then the seeds drop in October and then they go, they don't really go dormant. We say they're dormant, but in fact, they're not dormant. They're still active and still growing uh, underneath the soil, but it's a whole life cycle of activity that's going on below the ground. And we realize there's an optimal time to be harvesting, not just ramps, this is for ramps, but for all of these plants, right? So we looked at this and said, okay, the green bars is the leaf area, because now remember, the whole plant is edible. You can eat the greens, you can eat the, the bulbs. Interestingly enough, most of the uh, festivals that I saw, they were eating, but they were throwing the plant, the green material away and just eating the bulbs. So we looked at how, we looked at this, the development of leaf area in the bulb over time. And we figured out that the optimal time to be harvesting is the last week of April. That's when the maximum amount of leaves Leaf area is there and the bulbs are the biggest size, right? Now, whether they do that or not. And so that pretty much brings me to the end of, of my remarks. I'd be more than happy to take questions at this time. You know, I think it's a, it's a really new way of looking at a forest. To really look at the native plants that are foraged from food and medicine, you know? It just, for me, it's kind of made me 
think about the forest around Clinton, around northern New York, you know, down here, much differently than I did uh, originally. And that's pretty much uh, where I'm at. Thanks, Jim. That was, uh, that was interesting, for sure. I mean, I've been like you, I've lived in the area most of my life. I've uh, trout fished and just recently, I was like you, I was trout fishing one day and I said, wow, those, those are ramps. So yeah, I dug up, I got a stick, I dug some up. And when I got home, I had ramps and trout for lunch. Um, very interesting. Thank you very much. Glad to do that. Yeah. It tickles me that, you know, I grew up walking through those forests and hunting, uh, fishing the Riskany Creek. And I was oblivious to the plant material that was that I was walking over. And it wasn't until years later that I said, oh, look at this. I've got a question here in the chat from Molly Lyon. And uh, she asks, um, the last item you talked about, is it called RAMP, R-A-M-P-S? I think that's the, that's the uh, common name, correct? Yes, common name is RAMP, RAMPS. So that's not a plural. And right. The plural is really not ramps, but ramps. Ramps. It's just ramps. And it, interestingly enough, it comes from uh, the Gaelic, Gaelic word for a similar species that's found in Northern Europe. Uh, and the people in Northern Europe were har have harvested since, you know, time immemorial. Um, this allium ursinum, which is also called bear garlic, and they called it ramsum, R-A-M-S-O-M. Uh, and then when they migrated here in the 1700s, those folks, oh, thank you. Those folks, um, they migrated from Northern Europe and they came in and they came down the Appalachian chain, and they must have smelled the plant at the, in the springtime or noticed it, uh, and they started calling it ramps. Right. I know they are powerful. They are very powerful. You don't yeah. want to eat them raw. <laughs> <laughs> I like them raw. Oh, well, they're good raw, but boy, you're going to taste it for a while. Yeah. You might get kicked out of bed, too. Yeah, right, right. Yes, for sure. Got another question here from... Uh, uh, Leslie Hines, do and I, I know the answer to this one. Do slippery elm harvesters tend to kill the tree? Yes. Yes. Any and you know, of... you don't have to, right? And I've talked to, well, I say yes, uh, and I've, you don't have to because, you know, if you take all the bark around the tree, you're going to girdle the tree and it's dead. I've talked to one harvester, and I think he's quite ethical. They cut the whole tree down. And what that does, and then they harvest as much of the bark as they can get off it. What that does is then the tree regenerates through root suckers. Right. Right. So that's a much more um, ethical way of harvesting than True. what I have other, seen other people do in this. If they just strip the bark and walk away, then you kill the tree and it doesn't reproduce. Uh, Maggie Murphy's asked some really interesting question. How do you feel your research and work dovetails with work about tree communication, such as apparently what Peter uh, Wool Woolben has, has been doing? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, have, I, I, I think about that when I'm in the forest um, and I am sure that these plants are communicating um, to within themselves all the time. And a lot of these plants are clonal. So if you look at the black cohosh, you know, that one of the pictures of like that black cohosh, I don't know if you can see it, that big root that I had, there are multiple uh, uh, stem buds coming off it, stem scars coming off it. So one plant may have lots of different stems off of it. So you look at it from above the ground and you say, oh, there are lots of different plants there. But in fact, it's only one plant. And they can, they can send their roots out 
um, six, eight feet apart. So they must be communicating somehow like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I know there's research going on between about plant and tree communication. So uh, I'm sure that's ongoing. I'm sure, you know, all species communicates somehow. Absolutely. Yeah, we just uh, don't, we just don't understand it. Right. If not, uh, communication as we understand, you know, through root grafting and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm sure they're all interconnected in their own way. Yep. You know, we're part of the bigger picture. I was wondering, um, I know you're based in the East, but, and that's where your research is, but do you find these kinds of um, medicinal plants only in the old hardwood forests, or can you find them all over the country? You find them all over the country, but each region has different um, plants, you know? So, so the, the Appalachian forest, particularly the Southern Appalachian forest, are some of the most biologically diverse hardwood forests in the world. And so you get a lot, lot of uh, large diversity of understory plants. And so it's a mecca or real source for diversity of, of, of medicinal plants. But if you go to the Pacific Northwest, you still get medicinal plants uh, down out there. And you get some really important ones and very high valued ones for the area but they're different than what we find here. And what I find the biodiversity of the Pacific Northwest forests are much lower than what we have here, but the expansiveness of that plant distribution is greater than what we have, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you might have, you have fewer plant species, but they cover a uh, wider and much broader geographic area than, than what you see here. And then if you go to the Pacific, you go to the, the Northeast is different, the Midwest is different. Um, in Alaska, there's different, you know, species, yeah. It's all dependent on forest type and the eco regions that you find. And it's not just the United States, it's global. There's a global mark, both formal and informal economy uh, based on food and medicine that's being harvested from forests. Okay. Really fascinating, actually, when you start thinking about the, the diversity of the uh, products that are coming out of forests globally. Billion, tens of billions of people globally depend directly on food and medicine from forests. Mm -hmm. So another question, again, from uh, Leslie Haynes. Do, did you say the slippery elm was resistant to the Dutch elm disease? I'm not sure. Um, I would have to look into that. It may be impacted by Dutch elm, but not as prevalent as American elm. And that may be part of the reason for the, the um, higher mortality over time. Right, because I know essentially all of our American elm on campus are gone. You know, yeah. they, little by little, they're all gone. We do have a slippery elm on campus. It's a pretty good size and that seems to be doing well. Yeah. So I can't base its resistance on one tree, but it's, it's still there. Can you still hear me? I, my screen froze. Yep, I can. I can see you, and I can hear you. Yes, and I'm back to normal. You're back to normal. This is good. As Whatever normal. normal is, <laughs> really. Are there any other questions out there? All right, I guess now. Well, okay. Yeah. Molly says thank you so much. I have a question. Okay, sure. I'll try and answer it if it's won, for me. Who won the hockey game last night? I can't answer that. <laughs> it was a tie. It was a tie. It was, it was a, a tie. Two. Yes. Two, two, huh? Yeah. Well, that's great. That's I great. To, I used to play hockey in that arena. Yeah. Yep. Long time ago. All right, then. I'd like to thank everybody who showed up. Um, I got a weather alert on my phone. It said snow squall warning and 
within 15 minutes, it was a total whiteout. I can't see across the street right now. So mm -hmm. thankfully we are on Zoom and nobody has to travel home today. So uh, Jim, I'd like to thank you. It was fantastic. It was really great. It really got me thinking about some things that, uh, that uh, we should all think about preservation and uh, moderation yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Realize that when you cut your forest down, you're going to lose, well, you'll get the income from a, from the timber, but you're going to lose all the biodiversity that's in there. Correct. Yeah. We are trying to reforest uh, portions of the campus. The old golf course, uh, we're trying to reforest that. We've taken back a, a certain acreage of agricultural land. We're trying to reforest that. Okay. Uh, we're trying to manage the reservoir. Uh, property a little better, trying to convert it back to more of a, a natural hardwood forest, and uh, we cut it. We cut a large portion of the softwood that had been planted back there in the, I think, the 20s and 30s. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're trying to make some inroads into forest conservation. I, I remember sneaking into that uh, reservoir one time, and my recollect maybe I shouldn't say that, but my recollection that was that there were a lot of softwoods had been planted around there. Yeah, it was reforested heavily with uh, Norway spruce, uh, red pine, yeah. scotch pine, um, some fir, uh, but we're trying to slowly convert that back. That's cool. That would be good. That would, yeah. yeah. That's and you're not the only one that's ever snuck in there. <laughs> I would like to. I would like to see it lean a little bit towards forest recreation. Put some uh, cross country trails, snowshoe yeah. trails. Uh, it, it, it would be such a, such a, such a good thing for the students in the community that yeah. uh, hopefully yeah. that that will grant, get a little traction and uh, we'll be able to manage that for us for recreation as well. I, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I want to just chime in at this point and just say thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful, um, Jim, to do this. And those of you who are still on, if you want to unmute, show your face and join the conversation, you're welcome. Sure. I know not, I know Jim's willing to hang out a little bit longer. Right. Yeah, we've got about 10, 10 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah. I have a question. Um, are there any nonprofits that are working on trying to um, notify the public about which which of these herbal medicines are sustainably harvested or is this such a new area that people and, I, and i'm thinking of the monterey bay aquarium which has this amazing uh seafood chart that you can get you can download tells telling you which seafoods are sustainable or which ones are not sustainable so the consumer can go out and make sure they're only eating things that are sustainably harvested yeah. That's a good question. I, I don't know about up in New York, and I'm sure there are. Um, but I know of, there's, I work with a group here in Southern, Southwest Virginia, and they're working, they're uh, an, what they call an herb hub. Mm -hmm. And so they are working with landowners to get the landowners to grow medicinal plants, to actually farm them, what they call forest farming. And so they oh, to, grow, yeah. to grow the plant, and then they've, they're working with industry, and this one company in particular is willing to pay a premium price to those forest farmers who can verify that their product is sustainably grown. Oh, um, interesting, okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And that's, it's really relatively new. I say relative, probably in the last maybe 10 years, but mm -hmm. the whole concept is really taking off, this forest yeah. farming forest farming and it's designed for small landowners you know people that have okay. 10 acres so you know and oh, you so it's an area where people can start yeah they can start growing their own products and then yeah. yeah yep so this ngo it's called the appalachian sustainable development if you ever want to google it uh and they're working with landowners who small landowners and mm -hmm. then these people bring their herb to them they have a drying center, they have a cleaning center, and they they aggregate it and then sell it mm -hmm. to this company at a, at a premium. Um, wow, they're, folk, okay. they're folks at Cornell who are very active in forest farming and growing medicinal plants and working through extension agents to do that. Okay. Yeah. And are these, these products like black cohash, are those mostly purchased, um, they're mostly sold and per, by um, small companies 
small enterprises or are these also being purchased by large companies, you know? Or Yes and yes, no. So something like 80% of the production in Appalachia comes from small and medium-sized companies. Uh, it all starts with a household. All, yeah. It all starts with, you know, a household, one or two individuals, but then they sell to regional aggregators and then they sell to um, big corporations. Oh, I mean, wow, okay. Yeah, I mean, think big corporations. Some of them hmm. are really, uh, and actually, wow. a lot of our medicinal plants get exported as raw material to Europe, and then they might get processed there and then get shipped back to uh, the U.S. for retail sales. Wow, well, yeah. so it is a big business, yeah. Oh, it's mm -hmm. huge. yeah, it's a really big business. It's huge. Mm -hmm. It's it still amazes me how how big it is and how unregulated it is. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any comments about um, invasives in the woodland? I'm dealing with a lot of bittersweet, um, Japanese bittersweet, Japanese barberry, um, buckthorn, Japanese honeysuckle. Any comments? Uh, not very nice ones. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know how to deal with invasives. Uh, you know, some of the invasives have um, medicinal value, some are food value, you know, but I think those values are so small that it's better to try to figure out how to wipe them out. You know? On campus, on campus, we've been, especially up in the reservoir tract, we have been experimenting with cutting them off and applying a little bit of a uh, root killer type of herbicide to the stump. Um, yeah. But looking at the numbers that are there, it's, uh, it's a daunting challenge to think that we can keep up with it, you know, and we've got with bittersweet uh, honeysuckle and uh, Asiatic, um, the Asiatic bittersweet and the buckthorn, they're all spread yeah. by birds. Mm -hmm. You know, they eat the seeds, then they drop the seeds wherever. So, and it, it just, I don't know how we would ever get a handle on it. You know, this piece of property that I visit down, it's about an hour and a half south of here. It's on the North Carolina border and it has um, Japanese stilt grass and it has barberry. And I've been going there for oh, 15 years now. Every year I go there and I've just seen a proliferation of, of the plants. And like you say, it's, you know, it's all spread by birds. Yep. I guess I mean, one other follow-up question on that. Um, those are all non-native species, but wild grapes are also are native yeah. and yet they can do a lot of damage in the forest. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Well, a couple thoughts. Um, one, they provide food and habitat for wildlife. So there, there is some good to them. Um, two, they can be harvested for um, decorative products and for wreaths. So when I first started doing this research, uh, I went down to Arkansas and talked to some forest managers down there and they would let people come in and harvest um, grapevine. And the, guy, the harvesters would come in with these big winches on the back of their truck and they would hook it up to the grapevine and pull it out of the tree and winch it out. And they would go back and they would sell it for wreaths and into the decorative um, market, into the decorative industry. And then this was National Forest. And then the National Forest realized that it was impacting their turkey habitat and it was impacting their grouse habitat. And so they stopped it because it was, it was having negative impact on, on the wildlife habitat. So there's a balance, you know? Exactly. You know? Balance of nature. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? I think that might be it. You know, you, somebody mentioned buckthorn. So I make, I make tinctures 
out of out of tree products. And this is buckthorn. This is the bark of buckthorn. And this is actually from the Pacific Northwest. So it's a different buckthorn. <laughs> um, but they harvest the bark of the tree and mm -hmm. then they make, you can, it's for medicine. And I make tinctures out of it. So there are uses for buckthorn. Um, what does it tincture? What's that? <laughs> What does it tincture? What does it, what is it good for? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I do it just because I'm interested in it. Okay. You, know? you know, it's good for something. <laughs> <laughs> this was my, this was kind of my COVID uh, hobby, you know, and I would get these things and I would, you know, make tinctures out of them. But I've never I mean, if you think about the early, you know, early humans on the planet, you know, they foraged, they ate, they ate yeah. berries, they probably realized some, you know, I eat this, I feel good, I eat this, I don't feel good, or, yeah. you know, it's, uh, I don't know how the, I don't know how the early humans developed their knowledge, but it must have been over time and trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's only so much of it that grows, you know, the planet can only support so much. Yeah. Uh, on its own it, with the balance of nature you know if we're going to harvest all these products it seems like we do have to somehow commercially produce it because the planet on its own can't produce all that we would need because right. we as people are out of balance with nature pretty much you know yeah, yeah. so there is and that yeah. could be a two-hour talk right there <laughs> <laughs> we'll yeah. leave that alone i think that some of the uh uh, questions around sustainability um, is going to depend on cultivating these products. Like American ginseng, a lot of it is cultivated yeah. in farms, except American ginseng is unique because it has different markets and the stuff that is cultivated in farms, like in Wisconsin and Michigan, goes to one market and the wild harvested material goes to a very different market. Wild harvested ginseng is go is is gifted to people, so I will buy it and then I give it to you as a gift. Uh, and the more it looks like a human being, the higher the value. Right. Uh, the stuff that's that's cultivated, it looks more like a carrot. It's very fast grown. Looks like a carrot, and then it gets processed into the into tablets or pills or tinctures or things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and the price differential is is significant. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm but sure. it's unique. The other medicinal plants really aren't like that. So if you can figure out how to cultivate them, then you can reduce the pressure on the natural populations and it, at the same time meet this growing demand that we have. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, everybody. So, Jim, I'd like to thank you for a very interesting discussion today. It's been a it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Everybody who signed on, please uh, check your email. We'll send out more links for more talks. And uh, I'm glad that uh, everybody was able to show up today and enjoy this very inter interesting talk with Jim today. Jim, yeah. thank you very much from yeah. Hamilton College. We'll see everybody at the, at the next speaker series. Thank All right, you. have a great day. Thank you.